Well, it's a couple of minutes afternoon, folks, so uh, good afternoon and welcome once again to the Warren County Historical Society's Harmon Museum Lunch and Learn for May. And we're, we're so happy to have our good friend Jeff Wilson back. Um, those of you who, you've heard this before if you've heard me talk about Jeff. When I first started teaching seventh graders here in Lebanon back in 1972, uh, there were no um, computers, and I was teaching Ohio history, so I decided I'm going to have an Ohioan of the day. Uh, and so I went through almanacs, and I went through uh, encyclopedias, and every day I, I had to come up with a new, oh, I did it one for 180 days, a new Ohioan. And I ended up getting a, what you might call a recipe box. And I had hundreds of these little cards. Uh, now, some of them are yellow because they got chalk dust on them. Some of them are yellow because they're simply old. Uh, uh, I couldn't find one for May 19th, but on May 18th in uh, 1988, uh, Dawes Butler died. Dawes Butler was Charles Dawson Butler, born in Toledo. Five foot two, gigantic voice cartoon artist. He was Yogi Berra, Huckleberry Hound, Quick Draw McGraw, and even Captain Crunch. And, and he was the mentor for Nancy Cartwright, the voice of Bart Simpson. And uh, so I wouldn't have to have all these cards if I had this book and these other books in 1972. Uh, Jeff Wilson has made teaching Ohio history fun. Uh, he has made it interesting. And uh, even though I'm no longer in the classroom, I still love to learn about Ohio. We first met Jeff in 2017, I think it was, when he had first written volume one. And uh, he came, we were the first adult group he spoke to. I think he said he talked to fifth graders or something like that. Um, and he was nervous, but he was fun. And then we had him back a couple of years later when volume two came out. And we were scheduled to have him, I think it was last April, but uh, because volume three, the, what it was referred to sometimes as the library edition, uh, came out. And we were all set to have him, but uh, things were out of our control and there wasn't any lunch to learn. But they're always fascinating. He's a great artist. You'll find great drawings. You'll find great stories. And one of the neat things about volume three on page 76 and 77, two stories about Lebanon, Ohio, uh, which is really pretty neat. Uh, his wife, Patty, is here once again. Manning, uh, if you will, the, uh, the, the projector, the PowerPoint projector. Um, Jeff is a lot of fun. He's fascinating. He's got some great stories, and he's pretty talented, too. Ladies and gentlemen, Jeff Wilson. Thank you. <laughs> How does this work? I think that's it. Hello. 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 I am so glad to be back and also so glad to do the best part of the whole thing for me. And everybody watch out because I don't want anyone to get hurt. Now in celebration of the Neil Armstrong gallery and you know all the, 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 uh, the, the stuff about the flight, I put this together here and I'll have to see if you can catch them because they're a they're a, they're a coupon for a free copy of Ohio Legends 1, 2, or 3. Now, don't hit her if I throw it to you, okay? You got that one there, too? This is so much fun. I get paid for this. Anyway. Oh, there you go. Not so quick as you thought, huh? And a little bit more. Oh, that's all right. I'm not proud. I'll get it. And how about over there? That's pretty good. Did I get you here? Oh, there you go. Okay. It's free. It's free. 
Okay, I'll have to take the mask off now. So that's over with. <sighs> Howdy, boys and girls. My name is Jeff Wilson, but you knew that. Are there any Buckeyes here? Let me see your hands. Okay, I always start out with that because we're all Buckeyes and most people don't know, but they're too polite to ask, you know, how did people become Buckeyes? And well, it's all about the Native Americans, okay? They used to make decoys, much like, you know, that you would see of swamps, but full size of deer. And what they would do is they would use the, this real satiny brown nut for the buck's eyes, which I always thought was really cool, but it, I'll keep retelling this until somebody comes up and says, leave that one home, Jeff. <laughs> but anyway, I'd like to thank the Warren County Historic Center and John Zimkus for giving me enough courage to try it the first time and for having me back here for a return visit to share my books. And I have to tell you, I love L <laughs> the L&M and &M, M Railroad, all those really cool shops that you got downtown that you really shouldn't spend that much for stuff in, but you get it anyway. I mean, I just, I just love it. And it's rich in history and good people. Now, a lot's happened since last year, and I'm happy to see you again. I guess you can tell. Um, the last time I was here, I finished, had finished books one and two, and I figured pretty much that was the end of it. But more stories come in, and then more stories come in again. So anyway, I finished, and I'm now finished with Ohio Legends 3, which is the one on the end. And I thought, well, okay, well, I can just kind of settle down now and do other things. Well, people are, have, uh, <laughs> what they do is they keep sending me more stories. <laughs> more stories, I mean, some of these stories are great. Some of them are funny. Some are just... Uh, you know, just dumb, but I just, I, I just love any good, goofy Ohio story, okay? Now, what I was supposed to do today was I was supposed to not leave this out of the script and not do it, but before I, uh, I knew it, I was back in my research papers, and I'd done a, um, a, um, a talk for the folks up there at the Garst Museum up in Brookville. Have you been there? Oh, this, I mean, it's not as good as Net Lebanon, of course, but, it's, you know, it's just, it, it's kind of, they're part-timers, I think. But anyway, uh, but uh, they go on an awful lot about Annie Oakley, okay? Now, my trouble is, when I get hooked by a thought and an idea and get to chasing these people and we're doing more research on it, I just can't let them go because, you know, I, I try to keep everything, if you've seen the books, all on one page. Um, so that way, most people tell me, you know, they like it because they can pick it up and put it down and their kids are picking it up and putting it down and learning about history, which is pretty neat. But sometimes like an 1800 page book is just a little intimidating. So there I went and got off, the, got off the track again. I'm supposed to keep to my script. Now you guys tell me. <laughs> so anyway, I bought this 100 foot tape at Harbor Freight Tools, never had a use for it, but I thought I'd work it, I wanted to work it in today and grab some uh, willing victim from the, from the uh, audience, but I figured I, sh I shouldn't do that to him. Anyway, but there's not, just not enough room. The point of the story was I wanted to figure out how good Annie Oakley really was. I mean, was I listening to a legend? Was, was I listening to, you know, a lot of hype or something like that? But now the stories, the research that I did were, these were people were, were skilled uh, reporters and they were witnesses and I, you know, and some, they were all, um, I don't know, what, what do you call it when you, where you validate what you've said? It's, anyway, all the stuff was real. She liked to, um, she, uh, her big thing was uh, she had a Marlin uh, model 1891 that was a pump action 22, that rifle that she did for all of her tricks in. And she could take at 100 feet, okay, at 100, no, excuse me, it was 90 feet, she could uh, shoot a playing card, okay, and as the playing card fell to the ground, she'd shoot it four more times and never miss. She was, the most amazing thing that I had heard about her is she could take, and of course, the, at the Garst Museum, they have a bunch of samples, because, you know, the, whenever, you know, whenever uh, she came to town, you know, everybody loved her, but she could, at a 90 feet, 
hit a playing card edge on. Edge on. Now they say that she had a, like a 2040 eyesight or something like that, but, but the, the, the story of, of the woman herself, she was an extremely uh, strong willed woman. I mean, at, in her day, she was like, uh, they, were, they were superstars at the time. I mean, stuff that, you know, they read about them, it's like, okay, you, well, okay, every Western I've ever seen, somebody takes a tin can and throws it in the air, and the good guy shoots it, and it's like, just an amazing shot. Well, this part of it, that part of it, I don't know if it really did happen or should have happened or could have happened. Frank Butler, her husband, would take a dime, a dime and throw it in the air and she'd never miss. You know, and I just, I just thought that was just really cool. But anyway, um, one time when the Wild West show was touring in Europe, I did it again. I got off the, the, the thing again. Anyway, when... when um, the Wild West, uh, Buffalo Bill's Wild West show was touring in Europe. They would have a part in her, in her show where she would take and say, uh, um, I'll take a volunteer from the audience, okay? And the idea was that the volunteer would get a cigar, and sometimes she used this as a cigarette, which is much smaller still, and they would put it in their mouth, and Annie would shoot the ash off the end. Straight up, okay? And I, now, Frank Butler knew he could make a big deal out of it because nobody ever, ever, ever would come down, you know, from the audience, and up from the audience and get shot at, you know, that close. <laughs> but there was the um, Kaiser Wilhelm II. I guess he was really anxious to show how bold he was and how much courage he was. So before his entourage could stop him, he jumped down and put the put the cigar in his mouth. So as the story goes, Annie took aim at him. And historians nowadays, um, they say that if Annie had missed and hit the Kaiser, World War I might have been avoided. <laughs> so anyway, so as it goes, here I am, here I am starting up all over again. Uh, okay, and the guy's there and he's got the cigar out of his mouth and everything like that. And so Annie takes and she shoots and the ash falls. And um, that was her shot. So, isn't that amazing? It was terrific. But the cool part about it was after World War I had begun and Germany had declared war on the United States, um, Annie Oakley sent him a letter saying, I'd like to have another chance, another shot. <laughs> anyway, he politely refused. But, but anyway, it was, this is the, 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 I'm not really a researcher. A researcher would have some kind of structure, some kind of like, a, you know, method of operation and stuff like that. I stumble across things and I get excited about it. But anyway, I'll back, go back to this, this script so that way I'm not asking John what's for dinner. <laughs> anyway, uh, da -da 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 -da. anyway, once again, I'm lucky to have my wife of 46 years, Patty, here to scold and give advice and give me emotional support. But uh, anyway, I've gone through the, those that part. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> here I am. I don't want to burden you with all too many things the way I keep uh, jumping off the script now. Anyway, the, uh, I do not, first off, I don't consider myself a historian, okay? I'm not a researcher, okay? Um, I just um, have got a lot of people that have sent me a lot of terrific stories, and I've done the thing that I really personally wanted to do is, is draw them all up because uh, there were Medal of Honor winners. There are all these incredible people from Ohio that have done such amazing things. And my, my kids, they never knew about them. They were like, you know, they, they just kind of had this attitude that, that, that every day was just another, you know, another day. And they didn't realize the importance of um, what, what has gone on. I promise I'm going back to the check. We're just, just script now, I swear I will. Anyway, um, a long time ago, um, a poor Zanesfield boy walked into a library to borrow a book to read, but he was turned away. The staff took one look at his worn and dirty clothes and asked him to leave. Earl Sloan determined then and there that he would establish a library where all children would have access to books. 
1871, Earl went to live with his brother in St. Louis, who ran a livery stable and began to selling their father's horse leather. It was so good that it was soon being used on humans as well. Sales rocketed and Dr. Sloan's Lindman was advertised as a cure-all for sprains, rheumatism, arthritis, lumbago, <laughs> aches and pains. Sloan's Lindman was a success and believe it or not it's still being sold today. And in 1913 Sloan returned to Zanefield, donated $6,000 to build a library, $2,000 for the book collection, and another $20,000 for building maintenance. It's really a neat little library and it's kind of like going back in time because uh, they were very very fiercely proud that they weren't a Carnegie library you know that they were an independent and they were just a little behind their times they didn't they didn't have a telephone until 1997 that's true they they you know they, they just said they didn't need it so anyway now are there any of uh, anybody here that likes the Civil War? Anybody? Uh, one, one. Okay, it's got a lot of airplane. I, I love, I love the whole Civil War thing, but there are a lot of stories that kind of should be told, and maybe not should be told, but just wonderfully dumb stories. And I'm first in line. So, on September 21st, the city of Zor, Ohio, hosted a Civil War enactment of the famous battle, uh, battle of the Wilderness. You may or not have heard of that one. Over 700 plus reenactors participated with authentic period costumes, artillery, and cavalry demonstrations. Now the real battle in the, occurred in a span of over three days in Virginia with 20,000 Yankees, excuse me, a, yeah, 120,000 Yankees who fought more than 65,000 rebels in a small clearing called Saunders Field. Now how this is, in, what the, the whole logistics of the Saunders Field thing was that these two huge armies, they couldn't flank one another and because the, uh, um, uh, there was just no room because there was just a, there was a real thick forest and they couldn't bring, uh, you know, their cavalry up to thunder through all these trees and stuff like that. And today historians they agree that the Battle of the Wilderness was pretty inconclusive, but there was one skirmish that did catch everyone's attention. Now the, now the clearing of Saunders Field, where the two armies had exchanged fire, was so small that neither could maneuver through the forest in advance. In the confusion of the battle, two soldiers dove into a gully to avoid the hail of bullets. One was a Union Army officer and the other a Confederate. Both had lost their weapons and were unarmed. Soon they spotted each other and agreed to an old-fashioned fist fight. The looter, loser would be taken prisoner. They were halfway between these two huge opposing armies in full view of everyone and both armies stopped shooting to watch. <laughs> Many soldiers from both sides ran to the gully to get a better view of the fight. Now contemporary accounts say that the Yank lost and was taken prisoner and escorted back to the Confederate lines and the Battle of the Wilderness continued. I, I love those small little quirky stories, you know, that it, it makes these people, instead of being, you ever see those photographs of people, they must have had a terrible hard life, all of them are so stern looking, you know, and any, any, anything that brings these people alive to me, that they were just real people that had their own problems. Anyway, anyway, another Civil War story, and this one I hope none of you heard. Um, in 1863, after the Battle of Gettysburg near Cemetery Ridge, a Union burial detail discovered a dead woman wearing a uniform of a Confederate pirate. Now, according to the American, oh, that's good. Yeah, that's a, that's, a, I do that. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, according to the American Battlefield Trust, it was estimated that between 400 to 750 women disguised as men fought in the Civil War. Many of these women were from Ohio. It's difficult to accurately determine the exact number because they were only discovered and documented if they were wounded, captured, or killed. Dead woman soldiers were also discovered at the Battle of Manassas, the Battle of Shiloh, the Battle of Gettysburg, and the Battle of Appomattox. Surprisingly, women soldiers were able to easily conceal their sex from their male counterparts. Moral attitudes at the time compelled more soldiers to sleep fully clothed 
bathe separately and avoid public latrines. Inability to grow a beard would easily denote a soldier's youth. So it's easy to imagine why these women chose to fight, probably just like the men, for the money, for the patriotism, or the adventure. Now many of them wrote their and published their memoirs after, after the war. This one is a story about um, Ella Hatton. Now in 1859, oh, hi Ella. She, I didn't think it would come up yet. Ella Hatton was born in Zanesville and became one of the most fantastic and enigmatic athletes at the turn of the century. When she was 16, Ella and her mother moved to Cleveland where she began an acting career. By 1880, Ella was playing small roles in Philadelphia and New York. Now, at that time in her life came one of the merry blank spots that today's biographer have no verifiable record or clue of her whereabouts. This woman would, um, uh, uh, whenever reporters would court her, uh, corner her and try to get as much information from her, she would say, one time, oh, well, I'm from the Spanish aristocracy. And the next time she'd say, well, um, I'm a Mexican princess. And <laughs> she would tell all these crazy stories. There's every, it almost spanned a, a different version of her life. And, and so whenever people were trying to, you know, put things together and try to write a biography. Now the, now the thing why people would want to write a biography of this woman is Ella apparently spent much of the time that some people can't trace down studying the art of fencing with Colonel Thomas Monstere. Okay, this is real. This is the, he was a colorful mercenary and adventurer who fought in many South American revolutions. Monstere was known to have survived 50 duels with a sword, knife, and pistol and was considered a master of arms or a Victorian era Jedi. A Jedi. In 1886, Ella arrived in San Francisco billed herself as La Jaguarina, like Jaguar Arena, and challenged all male companion duelists uh, to a bout with knife, foil, rapier, or broadsword. For years she defeated almost every male opponent she could find, usually with broadswords and sometimes on horseback. In, in 1897, the Jaguarina had defeated more than 60 men and was running out of willing opponents to fight a woman who always won. In a few years, Ella returned to acting with not much success. The last trace of Ella Hatton is a clipping from the Toledo Blade as a featured actress in a second-rate touring company. And from there, she retires from publicity and history and disappears without a trace. But, <laughs> now there are also stories where she moved, um, to, moved to Mexico and had a hundred kids and got married. And there are also other stories that said, no, no, she stayed in California and started a finishing school. Now, I, that must be some finishing school, <laughs> you know. <laughs> because the thing of it was is if, if you read some of the accounts, um, Ella, there was no posturing there. They, they, they fought. They fought with sharpened swords and everything. She has, uh, what you can't see from the drawing I made, is she had a cut where one of those uh, uh, face masks had collapsed on her. The guy had r raced up with a, uh, with a horse and wanted to be the first one to cut down this woman. And he, he made this hacking move and uh, it, 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 it cut her across his face and stuff like that. So by that time, she had already unhorsed unhors him and won the one, <laughs> one to think with him. Anyway, okay, in December 1989, during the excavation of the Burning Tree Golf Course, workers discovered the most complete skeleton of a mastodon ever found. Now, mastodons, of course, were our distant relative, were the distant relatives of the elephants, uh, and they were around during the Ice Age between 10 and 14,000 years ago. They were covered with thick brown fur and weighed four to six tons and stood six to nine feet at the shoulder. The burning tree fossil remains were excavated for study and revealed that the specimen was an adult male about 30 years of age. And it also showed that it had a great many healed injuries, so they figured that he was uh, battling with other mastodons. Further study revealed tight cut marks on the bones that indicated that the animal had been butchered by early humans. Now, 
what, what makes this interesting is that the, mast the mastodons preserved intestinal tracts had not only still contained uh, their diet of moss and seeds and swamp gas, but also included 38 species of still living gut bacteria, which is like, it's crazy, they're, they're still alive. Well, the Burning Tree Mastodon was sold in 1993 for over $500,000 and is now on display at a museum in Japan. Now, we'll get back to my daughters now. Wow. Well, anyway, I love my daughters, both of them. They're just, but there came a time whenever they became teenagers that um, I, I figure all in all, I must have eight years of waiting my turn for the bathroom. You know, and in this next story, it's not like a, a really ground shaking things where there's something, you know, that shifted the course of planets and stuff like that. It's, um, it's about the Callaway girls. Now there were 10 girls born to Walter and Hattie, Hattie Callaway that lived in Ashtabula, Ohio. Amazingly, all 10 girls for several years lived on the same roof with their parents and shared one bathroom. Now that is amazing, that really is. Anyway, um, in 1917, Hattie gave birth to Pauline. She was followed by Isabel, Lucille, Esther, Betty, Edith, Doris, Lillian, Joanne, and Beverly. In contrast, today's American family average, which is only like 3.14 persons. In the early 1940s, Walter Calloway, a man who needed a hobby, worked as a salesman and, at, in the family and uh, stretched every dollar by growing a, a garden and canning as much food as they possibly could do. And each girl was asked to help with the, with, with the household chores. Now this next one is a story about Jim and Jim. It's, an, it's, a, it's interesting in its own way with many different levels, but I'm get, I'm see how nicely I'm staying towards the script, huh? Huh? Oh, be a good boy. Um, now I have forgotten where I'm at. Ah, okay. Now Jim Springer, I believe that's the one on the left, and Jim Lewis were identical twins that were separated at birth and adopted by separate families. The Lewis family of Lima and the Springer family of Piqua, by coincidence, named each infant James. Each family had told their adopted son had a twin that had died at birth. In 1977, Lewis decided to track down his brother and discovered Springer's name through courthouse records. The Jim twins were reunited after being separated for 37 years and found they had a great deal more in common than just their first name. During childhood, they both had dogs named Toy. Not too weird, but both Jims enjoyed math and carpentry and hated spelling. Both had been married twice to women named Linda and then named Betty. Both ones uh, had children, uh, no, had sons named James Allen. Both chain smoked the same brand of cigarettes, had hardworking, had woodworking shops in their garages. Both drove Chevrolets and worked for law enforcement in separate counties. Both Jims had identical medical records. They were nail biters and they suffered from tension headaches and also had vacationed on the same Florida beach, which is like phew, crazy, crazy. Now this next one, it was um, an awful lot of fun for me to draw. There she goes. That's uh, jo uh, Josephine Cochran, she's beautiful. Beautiful young lady. But anyway, I'll get, that's the fun part about it. There's, there's some stories that are just awful stories and terrible things, and, and some of these people have such beautiful faces. But anyway, Josephine, she's a, a wonderful nut. I'll tell you about her. Now, she's, she's from Ashtabula County, jo, and Josephine Garris, her name was Garris, was born in 1839. At the age of 19, she married William Cochran. Now, he was a prosperous dry goods merchant. Cochran's moved to a fine home in Shelbyville and began throwing dinner parsings using costly, costly heirloom china. The china became chipped and damaged due to careless handling, 
by her servants, and Josephine refused to let anyone else wash her dishes. Soon she began to wonder why someone had not invented a dishwashing machine and set about designing and building one in the shed behind her house. Her machine featured a copper boiler that used hot water spray to clean the dishes instead of mechanical scrubbers. Now, by the time Josephine had turned 45, regrettably, her husband had become an alcoholic and had died in, in 1883, leaving her in debt and nearly penniless. However, she continued to work on her dishwasher and uh, received a patent on the Garris Cochrane dishwashing machine in, in 1886. In time, many hotels and large restaurants discovered her invention and were eager to buy her machine. In 1916, the Garris Cochrane Manufacturing Company was bought by Hobart. Anybody hear them? And, and which became KitchenAid and is now the Whirlpool Corporation. Now, now here's the story that, that, uh, that, that I, I, I just, I've imagined parts of it and said, what is going on here? I mean, this, this kid was um, on his own, orphaned all by himself. There's a part where I think when he was, he was 11, he dropped out of school. I mean, 11, he dropped out of school and he migrated back to Cincinnati and got himself a full-time job at 11. But anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm getting off again. Anyway, Frederick George Jones was born in Cincinnati of Irish and African-American descent. He was orphaned at the age of nine and was sent to be raised in a Catholic church in Kentucky. Early on, Jones exhibited a natural ability with anything mechanical and had an inventive mind. At age, eight, at age 11, he dropped out of school, returned to Cincinnati, and landed a job at an auto garage. He was hired to keep the garage clean. That's the sound. But soon, he was apprenticed as a mechanic. By the time he was 15, Jones supervised the garage as a mechanic foreman at 15. In 1912, Jones moved to Halleck, Minnesota while employed as an auto mechanic, and he invented a device to confine sound with motion pictures and patented a ticket machine for movie houses. It's pretty amazing what this guy is doing. Anyway, by 1935, Jones had founded the Thermo King Corporation. Have you ever seen the semi trucks that, that, that have the frozen, like, refrigerant, uh, like, box like thing that's behind the cab? That's Thermo King. You know, okay? Anyway, um, and he had designed a portable air cooling unit for trucks carrying perishable food and made it possible for the first time to ship food, blood, and medical supplies long distance any time of the year was really cool. Okay, now despite having a sixth grade education, Frederick Jones was awarded 61 patents in his lifetime, and he transformed the shipping industry. Okay, now this one uh, is another one of those things where I got curious again, you know. I, did any of you guys have the magic ball whenever you were kids? I had one too, but anyway, I always thought it was cute and it was cool and everything like that, and you could get your fortune telling. But the thing of it was, why an eight ball? I mean, what's the what's the what's 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 the point? You know, I, I never get. But I have the answer for you. <laughs> anyway, Albert C. Carter was the son of a professional clairvoyant who called herself Madam Mary Carter. Sorry about that. Um, Madame Carter capitalized on the spiritualist case craze during World War II and held seances that were very popular at the time. Still, I'm not getting what, this, what that has to do with the pool. But anyway, um, Madame Carter's best recorded feat involved a device which she called the Psycho Slate. Now, it consisted of a slate inside a box with a lid that covered it, and the client would ask a question of the spirits and a scratching sound was heard inside the box. Madam Carter would open the box and the answer was written in the chalkboard slate. How she did it is still a mystery to this day. Now, Madam Carter's son, Albert Carter, we were talking about before, he was a confirmed cynic and saw this as a terrific opportunity and invented a portable uh, fortune-telling device that anyone could use in any time or place. 
The original Psycho Seer was an iridescent crystal ball filled with molasses. In, in 1944, Carter patented his Psycho Seer, and in 1948, his device got the attention of the Chicago Brunswick Billiards Company. In a Brunswick commission, Carter to build a version in black and white to resemble a billiard eight ball. And in 1950, McCann, uh, Mattel began to promote and manufacture the Magic H ball, and the rest is history. Now, you can see how sharp you guys are. Okay, you remember? Or maybe the reply is hazy, you have to try again. Does anybody know any of the, the ones that, that they had on the, on the eight ball? On, uh, the, because there were, you know, like there were 20 possible answers. You know, 10 were positive, five were non-committal, and five were negative answers. Does anybody remember any of them? Like, a, uh, as I see it, yes. Does that ring a, ring a bell? Or better not tell you now? Or don't count on it, which was mostly mine. But anyway, I love ghost stories. You want to hear a ghost story? Ah, okay. Okay, now this one, this one is it, I, another one of those things you stumble across these old newspaper accounts. It's, and you pick them up and say, this is preposterous. You know, but you read more and it sounds reasonable. This is about the Miamisburg Cemetery ghost. Now, that's the present day of uh, the site of Library Park. It became famous in 1894 for nightly sightings of a restless ghost. It was believed at the time that the ghost was of a young woman who had been recently murdered. Witnesses said that she walked slowly as if in a trance and didn't appear to notice those around her. When she reached the grave site, she would disappear. Now incredibly, these ghost sightings became so frequent that large and unwanted crowds began to appear on a nightly basis. Some sources suggest that in that year, hundreds witnessed the specter, and in an attempt to stop the sightings, her body was exhumed and moved to another cemetery. But the, but the appearances continued. They, they even had the, part of the newspaper thing that I picked up. There, there was a, a, a bunch of young punks you know, around the turn of the century. You know, they, went, they, they showed up at the uh, Miamisburg uh, Cemetery with uh, clubs because they were sure it was a bad prank and everything. And they, you know, tried swinging the bats and everything at her. And she just kept on walking, you know. But anyway. Um, the most uh, recent sightings of the lady in white were uh, reported in the 1980s. Um, I should take a break now. I'm, I'm going to get something. I'll get it next time. Anyway, um, now the Fairport Harbor Marie, Marine Museum was founded in 1945 and is the first Great Lakes Lighthouse Museum in the United States. Originally, it was built in 1825, and the lighthouse was rebuilt in 1871, and now stands 60 feet high with a spiral staircase and an observation platform at the top. In 1871, Captain Joseph Babcock, who was a lighthouse keeper um, and resided with his wife on the second floor, his wife was bedridden, so the captain bought her a great many cats to keep her company. After she died, most of the cats had disappeared, except one gray cat. Years later, curators at the museum, um, on, uh, and also lives on the second floor, reported many sightings of a gray ghost cat race, racing playfully along the, in the kitchen from time to time. The sittings, the sightings continued year after year, and employees at the museum named their ghost cat Sentinel. In May 2001, workers installing air conditioning vents in the base of the tower discovered the remains of a small gray cat. Sorry. <laughs> anyway, now this one is a more proactive ghost. Actually, this is another one of those ones where I stumbled across because I, uh, <coughs> I, I, I read it and couldn't believe it and got, I had to watch, read some more about it. But anyway, this is about the uh, Turkey Foot Creek treasure. Now, how this is, is remarkable is in this southern way. See, whenever I ran across it, I didn't have any, anything more than a, bunch, a couple of unsubstantiated accounts of people that had been run down by this guy on, on, when he was on horseback. 
but of course I couldn't really put that in in the page because it, you know there were, I couldn't have anything to point to. Anyway, in 1794, following defeat by bad <laughs> mad Anthony Wayne at Fallen Timbers, Native American tribes were ordered to migrate to Oklahoma. The Indians were said to have hidden $40,000 in gold so stolen from an army paymaster en route from Fort Defiance during the war. Intending to retrieve the route, loot and take back their land, they buried it on the banks of the Turkeyfoot Creek near the village of Shunk, Ohio. In addition, they left a ghost warrior on horseback to guard the treasure. Ever since, sightings and reports have surfaced over the years that confirm the ghost warrior will chase anyone away who gets too close. Now, the village of Shank, Shunk, that's a town in Ohio. There's, I have a couple pages of weird town names. Um, uh, oh, that's gone. Ah. The village of Shunk it still exists and is near Napoleon, Ohio, on State Route 109 in Henry County. And perhaps the ghost warrior still waits and watches. Now, this one is another one of those ones that I had a great deal of fun with. Um, this is another true story, and it's a hod, an odd-looking horse, I'm, you know. <laughs> anyway, Felix Rennick was an Ohio pioneer and a cattleman. It was born in Virginia and migrated to Chillicothe in 1807. Rennick owned a farm and made a specialty of raising cattle. He's remembered today as the first cattleman to introduce overland cattle drives and sent his livestock to eastern markets by driving his herds over Jane's race, uh, Zane's Trace to Baltimore and other cities. Rennick was also the first to import a full-blooded shorthorn, shorthorn cattle from New Europe and held the first public sale of the breed in America. Shorthorn cattle were originally developed as dual-purpose livestock suitable for dairy and beef production and were highly prized by early pioneers. Incredibly, Rennick's shorthorns were often trained to be ridden and jumped like horses at exhibitions and state fairs. So that way he could show off how, how healthy his cattle were. They taught him to be ridden by, by horses, which is pretty, pretty neat. Now, you guys haven't squirmed in your seats. You've been real good for me. Thank you very much. But um, the Ohio Legends uh, Department of Shameless Commerce would like to remind you that we'll be selling these books after the question and answer segment. And uh, OK, I'm done. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you very yeah. much. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us for this Lunch and Learn. Uh, please come back in June to hear me talk about Doc Williams, as he was called. Remember, there's a 10% discount at the gift shop. And also, there's a lovely art display going to be up for a few more weeks uh, on floor one on the elevator uh, by Sylvia Outland. And, and once the doors open on the elevator, the gallery is right in front of you. Thanks again, and hope to see you next month.